Church Christ as we gather together on this first Sunday of Lent, the season of preparation as we move towards the cross of Christ and his glorious resurrection. Throughout this season, of course, we want to take on spiritual disciplines that help to recenter us, help us to unload all the junk in our lives, get closer to the Lord and filled up with more of the resurrected one's spirit. In addition to today being the first day of Lent, Sunday of Lent, rather, uh, it is also Seminary and Church Vocations Sunday. So there's one day a year in the church calendar when we take some time to lift up uh, those who are currently being educated uh, or are educating uh, future church leaders. So we want to think about all of the seminaries, all of the Bible colleges, all of the places that help to form those who serve the church. We also want to think about vocations, which means anybody who works for the church. So today in particular, in our congregation, we want to think about Bonnie Willis, we want to think about Gary Bickle, we want to think about Jenny Lambert, we want to think about Rocky Sindler, we want to think about Holly Lake, we want to think about Jeff Seibert. Uh, these are all people who serve the church in a professional capacity. So seminary and church vocations Sunday. Pray for those who have been called to uh, serve God's church in a formal way and pray for those institutions that train them. At this point, I want to welcome our friends who are joining us online. If you go to richfielducc.com and you scroll down a little bit on the main page, you will see a bulletins and newsletter tab, and there you can download for yourself today's worship folder, our weekly messenger insert, as well as a children's activity bulletin. With that being said, I want to invite to the lectern, uh, Scott Lecter, the chair of our facilities uh, and maintenance committee, and he's going to lift up some of the calendar uh, announcements that are forthcoming. Good morning, everyone. Good morning. So you can follow along in your uh, insert inside your bulletin here. Uh, this evening we'll have a confirmation uh, group meeting at six o'clock on uh, Wednesday at our six o'clock uh, Bible study. Said last week, I'm sure everybody could take something away from that to be able to meet, meet on Wednesdays. Uh, next Sunday, then, uh, the, uh, comp, uh, we'll have communion, the communion Sunday, and the confirmation class will meet during worship also. Got some things you want to just touch on here. Again, the uh, Latin devotionals are out in the uh, North Dex. If you didn't pick one up yet, just pick one up. and. Uh, Follow through that uh, uh, through the Lent season here. Uh, we're going to be having a chili cook-off again. So that is going to be on March the 19th. Uh, for some of you, I promised to go back to my original recipe. I had to deviate a little bit one year, but I will go back to my original award-winning recipe for this year. Uh, Easter, again, right around the corner here, so we're looking for some people who may be interested in providing some special music for us on the uh, Good Friday service and also on Resurrection Sunday. So if you have any musical talents at all, uh, contact the office there, Pastor Will, and he'll get you set up. Uh, we're also going to have uh, Easter flowers available, uh, several different uh, different uh, varieties and price ranges there. Uh, if you're interested in purchasing them, you can get to the church office or uh, talk to my sister Karen Gerber and she'll get that lined up for you. You can put your money in the uh, offering plate with a note to say what you want also to work. And last but not least, uh, we're going to have, I guess not, not last day, we're going to have another Easter egg hunt. This year it's going to be on uh, April 2nd, Sunday, April 2nd. That's a Palm Sunday. So, Alicia, Becky, do a great, great job with that. With the NER support, uh, providing uh, funds, candies, uh, just all kinds of different things that we can we can help to make that a good event. So, if you're if you're all available, please uh, help out with that event. And also the uh, Family Living Center looking for donations for after-school treats for the kids that come 
home from school. Sometimes they don't have a good meal waiting for them, so if we can provide some treats and stuff, that helps out their their ministry, and, uh, and it's a good way for us to help out the community. So anybody that can help out with that, we can ask it out. Fellowship Hall for that also. Any uh, other uh, messages from the congregation that need to be shared? All right, thank you, Scott. Um, we do want to uh, lift up our thanks um, to Ken and Jerry Bates for hosting Fellowship Hour today. And um, for those of you who weren't able to attend on Ash Wednesday, if you want to do a little deeper spiritual dive, we do have the Lenten Commitment Prayer Cards out in the Welcome Center. Um, the top half gets torn off and, and thrown in the basket for the cup that gets burned with next to your palms. Um, for Ash Wednesday service, and the bottom half is for you to keep with yourself uh, as a reminder of what you're trying to do throughout this Lenten season. Speaking of Lent, this is a time of year in a very particular way where we stand before God and say, here I am, Lord. And so with that, let us ready ourselves, heart, mind, body, and spirit for worship as we listen to our prayer. Amen. to begin our worship proper, let us recall that even during a period of time like Lent, where we honestly face our failings and look towards the death and resurrection of Jesus the Christ, God's promises are true. Let's sing and celebrate that, rising in body and spirit to the best of our ability with our opening hymn.
Amen. Please remain standing as you're comfortably able and draw your attention to our call to worship and prayer of confession, which is inspired by Matthew 4, 1 through 11. Lead us by your spirit, we pray, Holy One, so that like Jesus before us, we might face our temptations. Remind us of those 40 days and 40 nights that our Savior fasted and prayed. Help us to acknowledge our hungers and stand firm before the devil. For we know that the tempter will try to use our best intentions, even twisting the scriptures against us. Remind us that one does not live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from your mouth. Forgive us, we humbly pray, when we put you to the test and keep us from abusing your promises of care for us. Then, even when we are offered the whole world, if we give our allegiance to anything other than you, we will be empowered to rebuke Satan and declare that we will worship only you, the Lord our God, driving the devil away and inviting your angels to minister to us. Amen. Thank 
coverings for themselves. Thank you, Bonnie. That's God's word to and for the people of God and indeed all of creation, according to the book of beginnings, the book of Genesis. And we pray as always that the Lord would bless our reading, our hearing, our understanding, and most importantly, our application of this and all of Holy Scripture. Before we dive into our message time, we do want to take a few moments and share God's love and truth with our youngest friends. So, as we talk to the kiddos today, are you hungry? You're hungry? Do you like apples? You like apples? Okay. Would you like this apple? No? You don't like green apples? No. What if it was a red apple? Okay, let's pretend it's a red apple. Does this, does this look good? Yeah? Again, pretend it's red because you don't prefer the green ones. Well, what if I showed you this side of the apple? You ready to eat? No? So for those of you who can't see, one side is very nice and shiny and crisp and pretty. The other side, apparently a worm got into it and it fell and got bruised. Now when I first asked Zoe if she wanted it, pretending it was a red apple, what'd she say? Yeah, sure. But what was the problem? Yeah, I was covering up the bruise, right? Now, does this whole apple have to be thrown out? No. No, no. <laughs> some people who lived through the depression immediately went, nope. <laughs> yeah, what can we do? You could eat around it, you could cut out the rotten, yep, the rotten parts, <laughs> or at the very least, we could turn it into applesauce or put it into a pie, right? So, in the story that Miss Bonnie read for us from the very first book of the Bible, we hear about the first people, Adam and Eve, making a bad choice. They did what they were told not to do. But what made it worse? They covered up their mistakes. The very last line that Bonnie read out of Genesis, they sewed together fig leaves and hid themselves from God. If you make a really bad mistake, if you get yourself into a lot of trouble, what's the best way to fix your problem? Tell somebody about it. Uncover the mistake. Admit it. So throughout today and the rest of the Lenten season, honestly, we want to be thinking about the fact that when we hide from God, we're actually hiding ourselves from the really good fruit of life, the really enjoyable things. And just because we do get bumped and bruised and make mistakes and other people hurt us and we hurt other people, does that mean the whole apple has to be thrown away? Uncover the blemished part. Cut it out. Cut it out. <laughs> and then get to enjoying God's blessings. All right, I'm going to pray for our kiddos, and then we're going to move on with the rest of service. Holy healer, we come to you in this season, and we want to bear our souls before you. We want to be real. We want to be honest. And we ask that you would give us the courage to admit our mistakes and give us the hope that we can move beyond them. Teach us not to cover up, but to face our mess-ups and trust in you to lead us beyond them. Now we want to ask that you would Bless our children and their continuing growth in life and in faith. For we pray these things through the name of your Son, your only child, our precious brother, Savior, and Lord, Jesus the Christ. And may all God's kids say, Amen. Pardon me just a second, guys. As we 
get ready to move into the message time, I want to acknowledge that we read a pretty hefty section of Genesis. And we also have two other scripture passages that we're going to be dealing with today. But just the Genesis reflection that Bonnie shared with us alone could take us in about 12 different topical directions. So anything that I leave out of today's message, trust me, I know there's a lot more we could be talking about. But I have to narrow my focus, okay? With that in mind, if you all would join me in another moment of prayer as we seek the Holy Spirit's blessing on our conversation. Giver of every good thing, you have created us in your image, filled with your spirit. You made us connected to one another and nature itself. You have asked us to be stewards over creation, enjoying its blessings but not abusing them. And that's a tall order. So we would pray that as we wrestle with our faith, as we move through this Lenten season, as we struggle with the scriptures, that your Holy Spirit would grant us wisdom and understanding beyond just the knowledge of good and evil. How do we live rightly? And now, gracious God, I ask that the words of my mouth and the thoughts and meditations of each of our hearts and minds might be acceptable in your sight. But we do pray through our rock and redeemer, Jesus the Christ. And the all God's people say, Amen. Amen. For those of you who haven't read the newsletter articles or the daily devotionals that I post on the church's Facebook page, if you weren't here on Ash Wednesday, our theme this year for Lent is Get Real. Let's be honest, genuine, authentic. The ancient Greek historian and philosopher Arian wrote, Most people, if they know they have done wrong, foolishly suppose they can conceal their error by defending it and finding a justification for it. But in my belief, there is only one medicine for an evil deed, and that is for the guilty person to admit their guilt and show that they are sorry for it. Such an admission will make the consequences easier for the victim to bear, and the guilty person himself, by plainly showing their distress at former transgressions. Here, both will find good grounds of hope for avoiding similar transgressions in the future. When I admit that I've screwed up or I've wounded somebody else, it sets them free and it sets me free. When I get real about my struggles, I can face and overcome them by the grace of God and the Holy Spirit's God. With that, let's turn to our Genesis passage. And as I noted before we prayed, this is a large set of issues contained in the passage that Bonnie read for us. And additionally, this reading out of Genesis 2 is one of the competing creation accounts. For those of you who've been joining us on Wednesday nights, this is one of those fun things that we'll probably be talking about. But Genesis 1 has one version of how the world and humanity was created. Genesis 2 has a different version. Each one draws out specific points. Genesis 1 tends to focus on the fact that human beings are entrusted by God with care over the earth to be good stewards. Genesis 2 talks more about our interrelational nature and our personal responsibilities. Genesis 2 that we're reading from today 
depicts God creating humankind with care and purpose, creating men and women, human beings, intimately linked together, and then poses the question of what we do with our gifting. Do we use it or abuse it? Here, if you want to get really nerdy about it, we look at the, the name for the first human being, Hadam, which, when literally translated, means dust or dirt. It has the same root as the word homas, which means humility of the earth. So from the moment that God breathed life into the first person, there's also this reminder that we are connected to the rest of creation, and we should never think higher of ourselves than we ought to. <clears throat> the Spirit of God is within you. You are divine beings walking around in human packaging. But let's get real. Pretty sure none of you all are either. Additionally, when Eve is created in this account, she is taken from Adam's rib. Have you ever met somebody who had a rib removed? It messes them up pretty badly. Even if they heal, it's like having scoliosis. The body literally becomes slightly disfigured. But if I gave you a rib transplant, how much more connected am I going to be with you? How much more concerned am I going to be for your welfare? Flesh of my flesh, bone of my bones. Now this passage over the ages has unfortunately been used to demean and diminish women. But is that what the author was intending? Was that God's purpose? If you are part of my physical body, am I not going to try to take care of you? <clears throat> Even more so than I would somebody else. Sadly, we have a tendency to cover up all of these realities out of convenience, out of a unwillingness or an inability to, to face our own humanity and frailty. But is that what the Lord requires of us? Is that what benefits us? There once was a, a bald magician, and he pulled a rabbit out of a hat. Then he put the rabbit right on top of his head and gently lowered the hat back down over the rabbit until it was completely covered. After a couple of seconds of wearing the hat, he quickly lifted the hat off and presto, there wasn't a hair on his head. <laughs> it's not magic how we do and do not cover up our basic humanity. Each one of us sins and struggles. Each one of us is a victim of the failings of others just as we wounded them. So let's return to Genesis once more. This passage is often referred to as, as the source of the notion for first or original sin. If I took a quick poll of those of you in attendance in person, what was the first sin? Disobeying God, that's a good answer. Often, often people will say the first sin was eating the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Here's the problem. Sin means to miss the mark in the New Testament language. And in the Old Testament, it means to go outside of God's will. To be incomplete, unhealthy, ineffectual. To willfully disobey. 
If they had yet to eat from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, how could they know they were doing evil when they ate from the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil? That's just human finitude. That's just being a person who is incomplete, fractured, not God. So what was the first sin? Well, if we continue to read beyond today's lectionary passage into verses 10 and 11, God has approached Eve and Adam after they've sewn together those fig leaves and asked them, where are you? And Adam answers, I heard you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked, so I hid. And God replied, who told you that you were naked? Contrast that with chapter two, <coughs> excuse me, verse 25. And in chapter two, verse 25, after Eve and Adam were created, placed in the garden, the Lord says, the man and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. So what was the first sin? Hiding. What is sin? It's willful disobedience of God. It's knowingly going in the wrong direction. And if you do make a mistake, like we talk to the kids about, how do we fix it? Confess and repent. There is no longer any condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, Paul writes. You can be wrong. God might discipline you, try to get you back on track. But are you condemned? Are we going to throw away the entire apple? But if we don't cut out the messed up places that we've been hiding, what's going to happen to the rest of the apple? It too will rot. But there's no shame in being naked before the Lord. I think that's one of the problems of contemporary Western Christianity. I mean, every Sunday, I come here and I put on a suit. I make sure I'm clean shaven. I'll talk about my beard, that's another issue. <laughs> every Sunday, we like to smile and shake hands. How are you doing, friend? I'm great, good to see you. But then we remember that we're supposed to stand naked before the Lord together. And those of us who are maturing in the Christian faith will admit to each other, I'm really hurting right now. I have a screwed up relationship. My finances are a mess. I'm super unhappy at work. I'm not getting along with my coworkers or my neighbors. And if we do that in the right spirit, when we get real with each other before God, when we treat each other like we are bones of one another's bones and flesh of one another's flesh, what happens? Ideally, there is no shame. We're admitting our brokenness. And then our sisters and brothers, more often than not, what do they do? support us. They start meal trains. They send cards and calls and texts. But if I lie about how bad I'm hurting, how can anybody ever help me? The big cover-up, the first sin in Will Stewart's opinion was that we hid from the source of our healing. 
And then it gets a little bit worse. Howard Baker, a former White House Chief of Staff under President Ronald Reagan, a former senator, a former ambassador. Baker said, it is almost always the cover-up rather than the event that causes real trouble. It's almost always the cover-up rather than the event that causes real trouble. So how did things get worse after the first sin of covering up, of hiding? Well, let's turn to one of today's other passages for a moment. If we look at Psalm 32 that our prayer of dedication will be based upon, we read that when we keep silence, when we don't admit our struggles, our bones waste away and our spirits fail within us. When we do acknowledge and don't cover up our sins and our failings, then God forgives. Psalm 32 in a nutshell. In psychology and recovery traditions, there's, there's a phrase that says, our secrets keep us sick. Our secrets keep us sick. And I would also offer that our secrets separate us. If I can't be fully, wholly, genuinely me, are we ever going to be that close? If I'm hiding some wounded part of myself from you, are we going to be real friends? If I hide those things from God, how can I ever hope to get well? Let's turn to our other reading for the week, Matthew 4, which of course is the famous story of Jesus' temptation in the desert following his baptism. This is a truly Lenten passage, and it's one that appears again in all three of the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. But here, in Matthew 4, Jesus willingly stripped himself down. Forty days and forty nights of prayer and fasting. Getting rid of all the layers of social expectation, getting rid of even those things that he might have enjoyed, the human <clears throat> indulgences. And when he was stripped down, when he was uncovered, he was then able to face his demons, quite literally the devil, according to the Bible. And how did Jesus overcome this spiritual wrestling match? With honesty and a thorough appreciation of the scriptures. How did Satan come at Christ? How did he try to trick him, tempt him? He twisted the word of God and took it out of context. Everything that Satan offers to Jesus is a direct quote out of the Hebrew Bible pulled out of context and applied in a selfish manner. If you would do this for me, then I will raise you up. But how did God create us back in that Genesis 2 story? As isolated, solo individuals? Or built for community and connectedness? So how does Jesus overcome the devil? He replies with more of the Bible, a better understanding of the scriptures. Yeah, I'm hungry, but if I let you turn these stones into bread just to serve me and my hungers, what's that going to do to somebody else? Selfless versus selfish uncovering who we really are. Now, many of you guys know that 
I'm an author, I'm a giant nerd, and so I love words, right? As a consequence, one of my brothers was trying to get me a gift not too long ago, and he bought me a camouflage cover for my dictionary, and it's just what I always wanted. I'd like to thank you, but I just can't find the words. <laughs> How do we cover up? And then when we're ready to be uncovered, how do we find the words? I said that the sin of covering up actually got worse. And I told you we'd return to that point. If you go back to Genesis 2 and you look at verse 12, there... God has asked them, who told you that you were naked? And Adam responds, the woman you put me here with, she gave me some of the fruit of the tree, and I ate it. Adam refused to take responsibility for his own error. Eve has enough mess of her own. But she didn't force him to eat the apple. He chose to eat the apple. It's not me, it's you. Again, as they say in psychology and recovery traditions, we need to ask ourselves the question, am I keeping my side of the street clean? Deflection and blame don't heal anybody. I've got to deal with my junk. You've got to deal with yours. We've all got to be honest that we each have a big bag of it and then help one another to get better, not tear each other down in the process. What is the point and the purpose of the church? The ecclesia. The called out and called together body of Christ. Why we exist. I want to suggest that it's the one place in the world where we should be able to strip off the fig leaf and say, here I am, Lord and then trust one another and God enough to be able to be fed and healed once more. Amen. Throughout the Lenten season this year, we will be Singing is our prayer of response, or song of response, rather. Um, a couple of songs. And today, this is one that's often more closely associated with the prophet Isaiah and the image of God as the, the potter. But I think it, it, it's appropriate for what we've been discussing in our scriptures for this week. So as we're able, let us sing. Verses 2 and 3 of Have Thy Own Way. <laughs>
Bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. One of the ways that God heals us is when we share in communal life together, lifting up one another's joys and concerns. So if you're joining us online, you can type any public prayer requests into the comments field of this video. If you have a private one, uh, you can call, text me. Uh, and we do honor your privacy, your confidentiality. Beyond the items that you can read for yourself in the messenger, uh, are there additional choice and concerns for the good of the church family at this time? <coughs> yeah, Chad. Today's my mom's birthday. Hallelujah. Happy birthday, <laughs> Bonnie. That's a joy. I think we've had a number of birthdays in the congregation just in the last week, if memory serves me correctly. Uh, yeah, Gail. Um, today's our daughter Emily's birthday, too. And then this Wednesday, Bill's having knee replacement on his left knee. This Wednesday, so Emily's birthday is today as well. Um, and Bill, you said Wednesday? Wednesday. You're having knee replacement on Wednesday, okay. We ask that the great physician would be attending to you and uh, pray for a thorough and speedy recovery. Thank you. Absolutely. Anything else, folks? Um, I do, I do want to honor um, the number of um, crises in, in creation right now. We've had earthquakes and weird weather patterns. Of course, we have ongoing warfare in Ukraine. Uh, we want to think about the, um, uh, the ecological disaster uh, that is transpiring in East Palestine right now. Um, we pray that people would, would stay healthy and well and uh, God's justice would prevail. Um, there's, there's a lot of hurt in the world, but the hope is uh, that when we get real about it, not only will the Lord move in power, but we get to be instruments of the Holy One's healing. So with that and, and everything else in mind, loved ones, uh, won't you join me in another moment of prayer? Lord, we, we cry out to you. We lift up before you our injuries, our weaknesses, the ways that We've been aggrieved by others and our sorrow over hurting them as well. And we would ask that as we acknowledge all of our pain and all of the suffering in the world, you would pour into the places that we empty out when we remove the, the cancers of, of bitterness or anxiety from our soul, wouldn't you replace them with healthy tissue, with your Holy Spirit, more of your word, your will, and your way? You tell us that anyone who prays to you, you will become a hiding place for them a refuge and a sanctuary. So we ask that for ourselves and one another on this day. For the gift of life in all its forms, another year around the sun or brand new life, we give you thanks. And we ask that we would be able to steward those gifts wisely and well. For our friends and loved ones who are facing medical treatments, continue to place your hand upon the earthly caregivers, guide and direct them, and fill our loved ones with your spirits and a sense of your power and presence. And for each one of us, whatever we're going through, 
Whether we're on the mountaintop rejoicing in your goodness or down in the depths seeking you, we ask that we might be able to be real, to be honest, to be genuine, to be authentic, to be transparent, most certainly with you, then with ourselves, and then with our sisters and brothers. And now, oh God, for all of our countless blessings and all of our many struggles, we turn to you through the power of silent prayer. For the Bible promises that when we don't know what or how to pray, the Spirit intercedes on our behalf with sighs and groanings too deep for human words. Receive then now our personal, our private, our silent prayers and petitions. stillness on this beautiful morning in your creation whatever baggage we bear we are grateful for the chance to breathe a sigh of relief in fellowship with your people and in your presence teach us God counsel us keep us from being stubborn like a mule, and instead, may your unfailing love surround us so that we would continue to trust more and more in you. Let us rejoice and be glad. Let us sing in our hearts, for you are good. In turn, we want to renew our commitment to the will and way of Jesus the Christ. As together we pray the prayer he taught his own disciples, saying, Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen.
tribute, we pray, to encourage one another not to be silent about our struggles. Anoint our gifts to keep people from wasting away in their groaning. Then even when you are pointing out our mistakes, we will not be dry. So accept our living and giving, we humbly ask, as expressions of our desires to be faithful. May our lives and tithes provide safety in times of distress, so that all people might know you are our hiding place. Time, talents, and treasures, let them all help to teach your ways. We do not want to be like stubborn animals and any marsh or trash. Instead, we long to be surrounded by your steadfast love, trusting in you. Loved ones, Lent is a somber, a serious season. It's a time when we take stock of our struggles and our sins. But as I always remind people, during those 40 days of Lent, they don't count Sundays. Sundays are feast days. This is a day of celebration in the midst of whatever difficulty you might be facing. Today we remember the resurrection at the end of that long and winding road to Calvary. So let us be a people who can be real with ourselves, our God, and one another. Now may the grace and peace of Jesus the Christ, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit, and the eternal presence of God most high be with us all now and forevermore as we go in peace, loving and serving the Lord 